Welcome back to Viewpoint. Thank you if you've taken a moment to send a question to the Chief Minister, Fabian Picardo, who's live in the studio with us. A quick reminder that um, our camera people uh, would normally be in the studio with us. We've asked them not to be in order to ensure that we don't pose any COVID risk to the Chief Minister, who himself tested negative earlier today. Uh, I have had the virus in recent months and Public Health Gibraltar considers me to be uh, relatively immune and, and not pose a risk to you, but I'm wearing a mask nevertheless, just in case. The last thing we'd want is for GBC to strike out the chief minister at such a critical point. <laughs> um, David asks, what are the anticipated economic costs to Gibraltar of entering into this new agreement, specifically on the matter of market distortion? Uh, will the prices of fuel, tobacco and alcohol increase? So I don't see that this is a danger to Gibraltar, quite the opposite. I think this is an opportunity for Gibraltar. Let me just give you an example, which I think is a better worked example for people than if I go through the detail of pricing, etc. In, um, in the time that the United Kingdom was a member of the European Union and the United Kingdom was a member of the Common Customs Union, France is also a member of the European Union and the Common Customs Union, and there's a very good trade in those products, in cigarettes, in alcohol, etc., between Dover and Calais, because the arbitrage is still there, even if you're in the Common Customs Union. You have some common duties and excises, but you don't have the same prices. The same is true, for example, between France and uh, Spain. One of the examples I use whenever anybody suggests that Gibraltar somehow is you know, a market in illicit tobacco, I say, well, look, no more illicit than the market between Spain and France. But interestingly, of course, Spain and France are both in the European Union and both in the Common Customs Union. So there are many opportunities even then, but we're not talking about forming part of the Customs Union. We're talking about a bespoke customs arrangement. That's why I'm going to consult widely with the Chamber and the Federation, and this is an opportunity to look at what the chances of growing our business there are, because it's not going to create shared prosperity if what we do is make Gibraltar poorer. The government of Gibraltar is never going to take a step that's going to make business less attractive for our companies in Gibraltar. OK, Rowan makes the point, notwithstanding what you've just said, obviously he hadn't heard it, but he thinks that the fact that Gibraltar does not have VAT is currently a rare and somewhat defining feature of our economy. Uh, and he's, he's, he was asking if, uh, w would we be able to remain free of VAT in a Schengen setup? I presume the answer is no. Well, the answer to that is yes, because I gave you the answer before, remember, that the Schengen matter, which relates to immigration, okay. is something that will be dealt with in the treaty. The issue of movement of goods, which is what deals with VAT, because we're only talking about VAT on goods, is something that we could, and this is where we want to do our consultation with the Chamber and the Federation and the government itself has its concerns, we might not do. So, and from your conversations with the, your Spanish counterparts, do you anticipate that that is something that they would accept? Well, it's only something that they would not accept if we were asking them to get rid of the customs control without doing that. So we're dealing with immigration controls and customs control. You referred me before to the answer you'd been given by Sir Peter Cajuana about this when you interviewed him. You can get rid of the immigration checks. One of the main concerns that we have as we leave the European Union because we've become a third country for the EU. Um, and yet still have controls at the frontier, which are customs controls at the frontier. So you would not have the complete fluidity if you don't deal with the customs issue, but the Spanish counterparts with whom we have been negotiating in the framework agreement have said that we will have a treaty that deals with immigration issues, and we could have a treaty that deals with customs issues. So these are two things where we have agreed we, we all want the first, we might or might not be able to agree the second. And the timeline for both is the same? Not necessarily. I think that we are looking at a treaty structure which will very likely, if we're able to agree it, deal with the Schengen issue, the immigration issue, in the first six months. It may be that we can agree some customs issues would be dealt with in the first six months. It may be that we cannot and that we feel that we have to keep negotiating or that there are agreements but that those require longer transitional periods. So the whole panoply of options is available in that respect. OK, let's go to, uh, you mentioned the Federation of Small Businesses. We had a question submitted by Julian Byrne, uh, which we can listen to now. We have had Brexit in our minds for a long time. And thank God now it's uh, over, or at least the new phase has started. We want to congratulate the government on achieving uh, a great idea and a great possible solution for Brexit, a long-term solution with long-term uh, benefits for Gibraltar. So as the business community, we're happy and we welcome the agreement, the treaty. 
Um, but we have some concerns, of course, particularly with regards to um, customs union and the movement of goods. So we know the movement of people is a great thing for Jib. We can have free-flowing frontier, which can make everyone's life easier and increase the levels of tourism even more than they have been in the last few years. Um, but people are concerned, and our members have already expressed some concerns about goods. You know, are we going to join the custom union for goods? And if so, at what level of VAT? So we know that the government has kindly allowed the GFSB to join the TVAC group. So we'll be discussing these things in detail. But tonight, if there's any information on that that the Chief Minister could kindly provide, that would help to ease our members' minds, and that would be very welcome. We also want to speak about the reciprocity between Gibraltar and businesses and Spanish businesses having the same rights to work in both different environments. That would be interesting to know what the plans are on that. And again, you know, we'll be involved in the detail, um, but those are preliminary things that we'd like to discuss, that we have questions about, and, and would like to help to shape the format of the treaty. To a certain extent, you might have addressed the first chief minister, but... Um... So on the question that, uh, that Julian has posed and the way that he has posed it, I think he actually represents not just the views of his members, but the views of the government. You know, we want to see the extra fluidity. It means more tourists coming in. But of course, uh, we want Gibraltar to continue to be attractive. And so uh, we are definitely not joining the customs union. I, mean, I think that the way Julian expressed it is important, I should point out. We're talking about an arrangement with the customs union, which could be a bespoke arrangement. That's what's provided for in the framework. Although in shorthand, we've talked about the customs union. And therefore, it's not possible to talk about what rates there would be, whether there would be VAT or not. There may not be VAT. We do other arrangements. But the, the important thing is that we share the concerns of the business community. That's why we want to talk to the business community before we start negotiating this aspect of the treaty to see what conclusions which could come to which might be beneficial. Because the other side of the coin, of course, is that if you have more tourists coming in, but they can still only take... You know, one litre of, uh, of alcohol, one litre of wine, one litre uh, and 200 cigarettes, you're not making as much from that tourist who doesn't just buy uh, wine and, and cigarettes, etc., as you would in the Dover Calais scenario, where those who come into Gibraltar are able to spend more as long as they're taking for the licit self-consumption market. Mm -hmm. And so therefore the business community might actually tell us, you know what, we do want in this because the differential, the arbitrage that we can maintain still keeps us very attractive to those who come to Gibraltar and will then take more of the quantities of what we have to sell. But that is all still to be, first of all, determined in consultation with the business community. Second, for the government then to make a decision on that, to present to the people of Gibraltar and then to be negotiated. The second part of what Julian has said, if you'll permit me, because I know you want to get so many questions, yep. um, is the same question I answered in respect of, of Gillian Burkett's question for Unite. Um, Paula submitted two questions. Uh, I think uh, you've addressed some of it, but um, she's wondering about customs agent companies in Gibraltar. What impact might this have on them? Um, and uh, does it necessarily mean that we're going to have equivalent tax regimes as, uh, as Spain has? You've Okay, so thank you for that, because I think some people have misread what has been published. And in some of the commentary that I've read, there's been a suggestion of harmonised taxation. There's absolutely no question of harmonised taxation, whether it's on corporate taxation, which is a services issue and doesn't fall to be considered in the context of the trading goods. So forget about that completely. So, to, but, to be clear, services then does not come under, even if you come to an arrangement not. and customs? Absolutely not. Services is completely outside. Our market in services is with the United Kingdom. We achieved that, despite naysayers saying that we wouldn't with the United Kingdom as we left the European Union. That's now in place. There was recently a Bank of England announcement on passporting and the services flowing through the United Kingdom through its trade deals with the rest of the world. This, as the framework agreement specifically says, is just about goods. No harmonised uh, uh, duties in respect of goods whatsoever. If we decide to do the deal on goods and, uh, and we're able with the business community and the cabinet to determine that we want to take that position, but no question of harmonisation. And look, I think customs agents will have a lot more work because there will be trusted traders schemes. The customs agents will therefore be the key trusted traders there so that we can suppress controls as much as possible whilst keeping control of what is coming in and out of Gibraltar. And we're already doing that with the Asicuda system that was developed by John Rodriguez and Customs very effectively. And I think the customs agents will be a key part of creating confidence in the Gibraltar market going forward.
um, associated, I think, with the services aspect, uh, gaming, would the gaming industry change at all? Well, I think the gaming industry would be finding Gibraltar even more attractive because, as you know, many people who work in gaming in Gibraltar do not live in Gibraltar. They live around Gibraltar because the numbers are just too big to, to have living in Gibraltar. Um, and gaming is a service and the attraction to Gibraltar of the gaming industry in respect of the regulation principally, in respect of our corporate rates of taxation, and in respect of the fact that there isn't VAT on the services that they might take in respect of their publicity, etc., etc. All of that continues because that's in the box marked services, which is outside of the scope of what it is that we're going to be dealing with. Okay. But there is, sorry, there is one key factor, if I can just comment on gaming, it's the last uh, or the penultimate sentence in the framework which is about data adequacy and Gibraltar maintaining data adequacy with the European Union will be a key factor, I know, not just for the gaming industry but for all industries that rely on data, that is to say everything these days. We've got a question about the timings. Um, some of it might be a little bit repetitive, Chief Minister, but I think the expression of the question might uh, you know, be beneficial for you to address some concerns. Uh, let's go to Stephen Cummings' question. Good evening. Chief Minister, I understand from what I have read up to now that in the timeline that's set before us for these negotiations, there is a four-year period where the parties have an option to agree to disagree and opt out. At what point in this whole process is the treaty due to be signed? At the beginning of this four-year period or after? Mr. Picardo? It takes me back a few years to be in the studio with Stephen Cumming. Uh, so thanks, Stephen, because that, I think, is a helpful way of me to set out the timeframes for people. So these six months are the initial six months that we give ourselves to agree the treaty and then the treaty will be signed. The treaty, as presently anticipated in the framework, has a four-year initial period in it, at the end of which there'll be consultation, and if the parties, that is to say the United Kingdom or Gibraltar or Spain, decide that, although Spain is not a party, it's the European Union that's mm -hmm. a party, that we don't want to move to the next stage because Spain has insisted that they want uh, Spanish frontier guards rather than Frontex, and we're not prepared to accept it, for example, then the treaty could be terminated at that period. Otherwise, it would become indefinite. But this is just what's envisaged now. When we start the negotiation with the European Union, the European Union, which will be the high contracting party with the United Kingdom, may have a different view as to what the periods should be. In fact, the European Union may ask us to make up our minds sooner, Spain, Gibraltar and the United Kingdom, about the longevity of the period. They may ask us to do a treaty that doesn't provide for an initial period and simply provides for a Frontex guards unless otherwise agreed, etc. So keep watching this space as to the time periods. What is envisaged now, however, is in treaty in six months, if possible and agreeable, an initial period of four years, and thereafter the indefinite uh, application of the treaty, with, of course, the potential for the parties to get out of the treaty if they don't feel that the treaty is working as it should, in the same way as the United Kingdom had the right to leave the European Union and every member state has the right to leave the European Union in application of what we now know is uh, too painfully Article 50 of the treaty establishing the European Union. Susan says she's grateful for uh, your explanations tonight, but is wondering why the government of Gibraltar hasn't published the agreement in principle. That's a very good question, and let me, let me tell you why. Because the agreement in principle has been sent, and the cover of the British ambassador to uh, Brussels, now he's an ambassador, now he's not a representative because we're no longer members of the European Union, and the Spanish representative to the European Union, to the European Commission, for the European Commission to consider a mandate to negotiate a treaty. So what was agreed between the parties was that it would be improper to publish the framework before the European Union had had an opportunity to consider it and respond. Unfortunately, because the European Union circulated, as it has to, the, the framework to the member states for their views as it works up its mandate. One of the people in that uh, uh, structure of disclosure, which now includes 27 member states and many people, so it's impossible to pinpoint who it is that might have decided to provide it to a Spanish newspaper, decided to provide it to a Spanish newspaper, and it was published before the parties could 
publish it together once the European Union had had an opportunity to consider it and respond, which would have been the right moment to publish it. But there's no question of this framework not having been published at some stage once the European Union had an opportunity to consider it. But you don't know when? Not, not, not in Parliament tomorrow? Well, it's now published, no, in effect. It's now in the public domain. The question is when the European Commission confirms to the United Kingdom and to Spain that it is prepared to work up a mandate. And, okay. and I think today you've seen Monsieur Barnier has said that this is still a sensitive issue, that he is not going to be involved in negotiating, but it will require a careful negotiation. And his deputy, Ms. Mm -hmm. Clara Alberoa, has said that they are in the process of seeking a mandate. So I think you have to accept also that when you've seen very recently the United Kingdom negotiation with the European Union, when the UK and the EU agreed things, they didn't publish what they had agreed. With what they had agreed, they went to the European Union negotiating team, the bunker, the submarine as it was known, the tunnel at one stage, and then the treaty text is what was published. But you never saw the equivalent of this framework between the UK and the EU when they had agreed what it was that they were going to write down in the treaty. OK, um, we've got quite a lot to get through still, Chief Minister. Um, let's go to our next recorded uh, question, uh, which, is, which comes from um, the... General and Clerical Association, Wendy Cumming. Um, given that we've had a number of uh, verbal and written reassurances on BCA since last September, um, uh, the GGC question today relates to HM Customs. Um, given that there's going to be many changes to customs as a result of the treaty, um, to name but a few, the uh, imposition of EAT, the rendering unnecessary of uh, customs checks on the control of people, and the simplification of customs procedures or the formalization of these um, in customs points in Spain, um, what uh, are there going to be any changes to the roles and responsibilities of HM Customs, particularly the enforcement and collection sections? Um, and, um, you know, more more importantly for the GGCA, um, how is this going to affect the workforce? Thank you. So th thanks, Wendy, for that. But, uh, but I don't accept that there is going to be um, an acceptance of VAT, etc., for all of the reasons I've already set out. This is to be negotiated, and what we'll see will be very bespoke. It won't be the customs union and the elimination of controls in the way that is envisaged um, if we join the customs union, because what we're looking at is bespoke. We'll, we'll still require customs to be very involved, perhaps not just at the frontier. This is what will change. So let me give you an example which I've, I've always been struck by. When I've travelled from Malaga to Brussels, um, or even when I've travelled from London to Brussels, and I arrive in Brussels both from the UK and Spain, the UK then in the European Union, both of those and, and Belgium in the customs union, I've still met customs officers. Because it's one thing to be in the common customs union and be able to take um, you know, cigarettes and perfume and, and, and uh, alcohol across a frontier without checks. But that doesn't mean that you have the right to take controlled drugs across a frontier. And so when you land in Brussels airport, you meet Belgian customs, even though you're still within the customs union, and they're still doing their jobs of controlling people and ensuring that they're not bringing any controlled substances into the jurisdiction. And they do that not just at the border. And one of the things that customs in Gibraltar do very effectively, and we sometimes don't realise, they don't just have the presence at the border. Customs are involved in ensuring that the uh, illicit market in tobacco is pursued at night in Gibraltar. They're involved at sea, not just at the entry points. So customs will continue to have that role, enforcement in particular, um, and trusted trader schemes will have to be brought into effect. So I see customs once again doing, continuing to do Gibraltar Proud just yesterday, 8.5 um, kilos, I think, of, of cannabis, you know, joining the, the European customs family in a way that they continue to be recognised for the experts that they are and what happens in this part of the world. No concerns whatsoever that they would somehow suffer. In fact, as usual, I think that Gibraltar will see increased business and our customs men and women will be even more important in ensuring that Her Majesty's customs duties are paid in Gibraltar. A question sent in by Karim before the start of the programme about the waters around the rock. W will there be a solution to the issue of Spanish fishing in Gibraltar waters, commercial fishing, he says, in this deal? Um, would Frontex be involved in patrolling BGTW and enforcing, um, helping enforce other aspects? 
And finally, a, a distinct item, uh, what agreement, if any, is there on the environment? So there, there is a reference to environmental standards and fishing commercially with nets in a way that is contrary to Gibraltar's environmental legislation, is contrary to the best environmental practice, and this is one of the things that we have been dealing with, as you know. We created the artificial reef for this purpose, and this is a game of cat and mouse. Our environmental agency is constantly trying to ensure that our laws are upheld. The Royal Gibraltar Police are involved in this on occasion as well. Frontex will not be patrolling Gibraltar's waters. That's not what we envisage. What we do need to understand is that we are on the southern flank of Europe. Illegal immigration is something on which we must work together. But BGTW will be something which will be exclusively patrolled by those agencies who have the power to do so under our laws. That is to say the GDP, HM Customs, um, our environmental agency, and of course our lead agency, the Royal Gibraltar Police. Mark. Um, on behalf of the Port Operators Association says, following on from the news that uh, we are hoping to join Schengen, uh, this agreement, although welcome on the wider national level, raises many questions in respect of how we intend to process seafarers in future of particular interest, Indian, Filipino and others who travel uh, with Siemens Books, ILO Siemens Books via London, doing away with visa requirements imposed by the EU. Mark says he understands its early days and we may not as yet have an overall picture of how this will work in practice, but is there any information uh, that can be cascaded to the members of the Port Operators Association? And if I may, Chief Minister, I think we've got a very similar question from Richard, uh, who sent his in, uh, in video form. So uh, let's listen to this one first and then you can answer them both together. Good evening. I have the following question for the Chief Minister tonight. Crew changes of Schengen visa requiring nationals, for example, like Filipinos, Russians, Indians, etc., um, is very big business for almost all the ship agents in Gibraltar. And Gibraltar enjoys a very good reputation in this respect. Uh, crew changes is a very big advantage that we enjoy because we are not part of the Schengen area. Shipping is generally regarded as a pillar of the Gibraltar economy and the industry supports many families, both directly and indirectly. So any loss of business with the, with the crew changes will undoubtedly lead to redundancies in the industry. So can, the, can Mr. Picardo please confirm that crew changes will remain unaffected or will there be any changes? Thank you very much. Mr. Picardo. So I can give a complete reassurance to those families who are involved in the shipping trade in Gibraltar. In fact, the Schengen border regulation already envisages exactly the same regime, which is visa-free travel for those seafarers who have ILO books. They will not need new bureaucratic requirements to come into Gibraltar. I think it's Article 3 of Annex 7 of the Schengen border regulation that gives them that right to visa-free travel. Article 36 of the visa regulation, and I believe it's um, Article 11 of the Schengen Border Code, which is Regulation 2016-399, in Article 11, which exempts them even from having their passport stamped if they have the ILO book. So this will be even easier going forward um, and in a way that I hope will bring even more business to Gibraltar, not less. So I hope that reassurance really shows our ship agents that this is a great opportunity for them also. A concern at sea, but also at, um, on, on the land to a, to a lesser extent, I guess. A question from Jared. Um, with concerns about drug trafficking in the region, could the Chief Minister confirm whether there are discussions taking place with the Spanish counterparts, uh, about, with York Spanish counterparts, about authorities, Gibraltar authorities and Spanish uh, authorities being allowed to cross between uh, what is currently the land frontier for the purpose of a hot pursuit. So this is a specific part of the Schengen regulation that you have to sign up to specifically. This is not envisaged as something that would be agreeable to us, but what is important to us and what we must do is continue the excellent relationship that there is today between the Royal Gibraltar Police and Customs and their Spanish counterparts. We have just seen yesterday a joint operation which resulted in a number of individuals arrested in Gibraltar being involved in, uh, in uh, cross-border drug trade and the stronger that the links are between our law enforcement agencies, the better the opportunity to rebut those, uh, those who may be involved in drug trafficking or indeed people trafficking or any other illicit activity. That's what I want to see more of, but I want to see Gibraltar's jurisdiction exclusively preserved as Gibraltarian. 
Bob says that many Spanish newspapers are talking about the frontier fence being taken down. What's your position on this? Uh, Bob thinks that most Gibraltarians would be against that. This Gibraltarian is against that too. Let's be very clear that the Schengen rules are not about taking down frontiers, although you might express that in, in lay terms. In fact, when, when Schengen was created, people talked about the elimination of frontiers. But actually, the Schengen rules specifically provide that what you're doing is suppressing controls. And you have the, in fact, obligation to bring back the controls when the time comes, if you're required to do so, if there's a public policy or a public health reason or a public security reason. We have seen that when France reimposed controls with Italy after Italy was permitting those who were landing in Lampedusa to make their way up through Italy to France and then to the United Kingdom and Germany with the issues between Turkey and Greece and also when, when the, the immigrants were coming through Greece into France as well and also of course now with Covid. So we've seen the reimposition of those controls. In order to reimpose controls, you have to keep the frontier infrastructure so that when you put the controls back, you can actually control people at the old control points. And that's what we would see being maintained in Gibraltar. In any event, as you know, to the west of our entry point, you have an MOD residential facility, which has uh, the frontier and the, the fence in the same place. And to the east, you have the perimeter of the airport, the Jet A1 storage facility and the, the facilities for the tunnel and all of that access. So you've got secure areas and really what you have is left is the area of the loop where we'll be building a small, I think, I think the Chronicle today called it Schengen Shack. Um, and then really all you have left is space for more vehicle lanes to be provided so that we can make more agile the traffic. I should say that a number of people, including Pepe, uh, have asked uh, this question about the frontier fence. So it's obviously a concern for, for a number of people. Um, Liz wants to know, uh, I think you've probably addressed it, but maybe you can answer this briefly. Uh, in respect of joint cooperation, uh, such as on policing Gibraltar's waters, what you're talking about is a signed agreement with clear details rather than a gentleman's understanding. Huh? That's exactly right, but in fact, there's a lot more than just policing. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that is important that people pick out from the framework is the word judicial. So if you look at that paragraph, it talks about police and judicial cooperation. One of my concerns going into this negotiation is that even though our police officers have been working very closely together for some time, when the time comes for Spanish police officers to come and cooperate with our laws, with our judges, with our courts, they refused to come for some reason that uh, Franco uh, dreamt of in the 1950s. So what we're talking about is not just helping each other operationally, but supporting each other in prosecutions. Gibraltar police officers have always gone, if required, in support of a prosecution into Spain to give evidence in Spanish courts. Now we are looking at setting up a structure that will permit those who are Spanish police law enforcement, who might be involved in recovering bails, etc., to come to Gibraltar to give evidence to the jurisdiction which will be trying those individuals. I think that's a huge step forward. It's a demonstration of modernity that has just not been around and we have been hankering for for some time in having recognition also of our Supreme Court. Alan asks, um, the agreement in principle, as published by the uh, El Bais newspaper, is short. Uh, he'd like to know if you can reveal what aspect held up the agreement so that it was only announced on the afternoon of the 31st of December <laughs> and what changed to allow it to be an agreement in principle. It's, it's fascinating because uh, another newspaper had said it was 11 pages long. When it wasn't 11 pages long, I knew it was eight pages long. Um, and the, the, you know, we have been stuck. I have, I have no problem telling you. I, we have been stuck probably for a month and a half or two months with the thing that we were stuck on when we started this process. And of course, it's the issue relating to uh, the Schengen controls, how those would be carried out, where people would be located and would not be located. I've told you that I think that um, Minister Laya, Foreign Minister Laya has brought a different sensitivity to this discussion. That doesn't mean that this was easy. And that woman is a tough cookie when it comes to negotiating. And Dominic Raab was an absolute 
tiger when it came to Gibraltar in ensuring that we protected the issues that were fundamental to us. And look, therefore, we had to work very carefully so that well, the important thing here is that neither the United Kingdom nor Spain nor Gibraltar have beaten any of the others. We have all one. We've come up with a framework that we think works for everyone without anybody's red lines being crossed in a way that is positive and ensures that all of us can take something forward from this agreement. James wants to know if there are other aspects that have not yet been published uh, in the agreement, such as we, we saw some uh, annexes. Are there other papers which attach to the agreement? Well, there's one, there's one asterisk in paragraph um, 10, I think, which you've seen a reference to, um, or paragraph 8 that you've seen a reference to, and that hasn't yet been published for the reasons that we've set out. In other words, we think that it is wrong to publish things before the European Commission, which is the, the entity that will be a high contracting party to this treaty, has had the chance to consider this, this and say, OK, I'm prepared to sit down and have this negotiation. And then we would have said, on the basis of these documents. And uh, to state the obvious, some of the as yet unseen documents interact with the document that people might have seen published by El País, potentially even changing the way that one might interpret what is already uh, published. Well, you can see from the asterisks that that document exists. It's referred to in the document that has been published. That's why I took the view and I tweeted that the way that El País had presented what it published was slightly skewed. And I know that the, the journalists who wrote the article didn't take kindly to that and they they tried to you know, raise that with me on Twitter, but look, it's very obvious that you're interpreting those pages and you know that there is an additional document which is referred to in those pages. Okay, um, there's a question about the, the mechanics, if you like, of how this will work. Patricia wants to know if the government were to cross a, a red line, um, perhaps you don't think that it's crossing it or perhaps the people uh, disagree, would the people be allowed to vote on your decision? What would happen if another political party was voted in and didn't agree with the actual agreement? So there's two questions there. Firstly, so, for the people of Gibraltar, and secondly, for, I suppose, the government of Spain. So we've, we won an election on the basis of negotiating a Brexit treaty that dealt with issues relating to Schengen and, and the Common Customs Union. So we're giving effect to the views of the people of Gibraltar in the last general election held a year before we announced this framework, which gave us the ability to enter into this negotiation. But there's going to be a concordat between the United Kingdom and uh, Gibraltar, because Gibraltar should have the right to be the entity that determines whether or not to terminate these arrangements in keeping with whatever termination provisions are provided for in that treaty. And look again, we're looking at the detail of things. Patricia is absolutely right to ask me this question, but we haven't even signed the treaty yet, and we're already talking about how we would get out of it, potentially. Um, let's, uh, let's wait until we've got that treaty, but the way that I envisage this happening is that there will be a provision for a Gibraltar government to be able to terminate the treaty in the event that they take the view, if it's a future government, or, or even the current government, if we were to take the view that the treaty was not being complied with, to exercise that equivalent of Article 50 in order to get Gibraltar out of these arrangements if we felt it was inappropriate. But of course, let's always remember that those termination provisions will cut both ways and it wouldn't just be us that might be able to do that, it might also be the European Union. Okay, so... Um... Jackie wants to know if a right-wing government were to be elected in Spain, would the treaty, should you agree it in six months' time and agree it for an initial four-year period, would that treaty be ironclad and protected from attack from the right-wing, a future right-wing government in Spain? There's no such thing as an ironclad international treaty. We have to understand that. It is more likely to be dependable if it is an agreement with the European Union than it is if it is an agreement with Spain. But, uh, of course, if Spain is a member state of the European Union and she is the one with the interest in Gibraltar, I think it is very likely that a Spanish right-wing government might be able, depending on how we phrase this termination provision, that's why if it's very easy to engage, then they would also potentially be able to engage it very easily, and they could seek to undo the treaty despite the damage that that could do to all of the people of Spain around us who would have a lot, of, uh, a lot to lose if they were to terminate the agreement. But you know, I cannot tell you, because I, I don't believe in misleading people, that it is possible to establish a treaty that is ironclad. And the example I always give when I'm asked this question is the Treaty of Utrecht. Look, the Treaty of Utrecht contains a provision that Gibraltar was given to the United Kingdom forever, 
And we always use the shorthand in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And no sooner was the ink dry from the quills that had been used to sign the Treaty of Utrecht that Spain was trying to take Gibraltar back, not respecting the fact it had been ceded in perpetuity. So you've got to understand public international law is not like private national law, and it's not very easy to take things to dispute resolution and to hold the ring whilst you do that. Okay. Um... Anselmo has perhaps a more constructive, positive take on the opportunities that this might present. How can we take advantage of the new treaty, like being able to get together to develop new projects which would be for the best of both sides, both uh, Gibraltar and the nearby Campo? He cites as an example the Cordova Agreement. Uh, would the uh, changes to the airport envisaged there be more likely? So the Cordoba Agreement was different, as you've heard Sir Peter explain in the context of, I think, the interview he gave to you, because the Cordoba Agreement was a political agreement done by way of choice. In other words, after joint sovereignty with the socialist government in Madrid, there was an opportunity to try and do something and try and unlock things. But those agreements were not signed agreements. They were not public international law agreements. They were political agreements, which were going to have repercussions in the subsidiary law of the European Union in directives and regulations, etc. And then that wasn't honored because there was a change of government in Spain. Here we're talking about creating a treaty. And I hope that in the context of the answer I've given a moment ago, that is that no, no treaty is ever going to be ironclad, it does create more legal certainty, especially if we don't have this initial four year period, so that people can invest. And look, what, what actually I think is interesting to think about is not just the opportunities for Gibraltar, La Línea, Los Barrios, San Cloque, Algeciras, the whole of the area around us and beyond. It's also to triangulate across the Straits of Gibraltar into Tangier. You've got in Tangier and in Algeciras some of the biggest ports in the Mediterranean. In Gibraltar, the biggest bunkering port in the Mediterranean. You've got an airport in Gibraltar as well. You've got an airport in Tangier and you've got the fifth uh, of the world's oil going past the Straits. You have an opportunity to develop the railway upwards into Europe. Look, that is you know, an opportunity for trade like there's probably nowhere else in the world if you have the legal certainty that passage between Gibraltar and the rest of the Spanish hinterland is guaranteed under a treaty. Chief Minister, uh, for, you'll forgive me if you answered it uh, earlier in response to Jackie's question, but I'm trying to uh, monitor a lot of questions and pick out the best ones. Would you, do you anticipate putting whatever arrangement you arrive at with um, the uh, EU, effectively, through the UK, do you anticipate putting that to the people uh, in the form of a referendum? I, I've got to be very clear with people. We won an election to do these arrangements. And if any of these arrangements were to change the status of Gibraltar, the constitutional status of Gibraltar, the relationship with the European Union, then it would be absolutely right to put them to referendum. None of that is envisaged at all. We're talking about a trade relationship and an immigration relationship, which is one that can be altered after a general election if necessary. But there are some circumstances, once we have an agreement, and indeed probably once the, the agreement is operating, where I can see the people of Gibraltar having to have their say. I don't think it's in Gibraltar's interest that I should say more at this stage, because remember that I'm saying a lot and we haven't yet sat down to negotiate the treaty and I need to protect what I think are the negotiating advantages that Gibraltar should have in the context of the negotiation of the treaty. Okay, Chief Minister, uh, I think a, a, an issue, um, we've only got a few minutes left, but are any steps being taken to build a checkpoint at the frontier rather than having a ferry service, which Maria believes is somewhat of a waste of money? Is the customs union arrangement the proposed solution? So the customs union arrangement, or a bespoke aspect of the customs union, might be an arrangement for that in the long term. In the short term, there is an issue with the European Commission, and Spain and Gibraltar are trying with the United Kingdom to resolve that, so we don't have to sail goods of animal origin coming from third countries, namely the United Kingdom, transiting the European Union through the ferry, and there might be the possibility of once again having them come through the land frontier. It is complicated because of the distance between what is known as the BIP in Algeciras and Gibraltar. There are none of those issues for goods of European origin. Um, but look, we've resolved it for now. We know that we have a solution for six months and we hope to have a treaty in six months. So hopefully we'll be able to resolve those issues in that time frame. Last question to Tracy, Chief Minister, and if you could keep it brief. Given our close relationship with Great Britain, does this uh, uh, agreement in principle, would it 
en encourage further, a closer alignment with the UK, present new opportunities such as an increased uh, aspect of armed forces in Gibraltar or potentially uh, further uh, arrangements with the NHS? I hope so, and I think that is happening already. We've got new arrangements with the NHS for elective surgery, which we've already announced. We're going to procure our drugs through the NHS, which we've already announced. We've got access to the United Kingdom market in services. So uh, we are continuing to pay UK rates for Gibraltar students. Um, and the way that I see this developing, I think Gibraltar is going to be closer than ever to the United Kingdom and increasing that proximity with the UK. Nothing is ever going to prize us from the United Kingdom. And I made the point today in an interview in the Gibraltar Chronicle, neither the carrot or the stick will ever cleave us from the UK. Chief Minister, I know that uh, the opposition um, MPs uh, will uh, want to pick you up on a lot of what you've said, so I'm sure we'll be discussing and potentially debating this in, in the coming weeks. Thank you ever so much. If you took time to write in a question for the Chief Minister, we've tried to get through as many as possible, haven't been able to get through a considerable number. But thank you for watching Viewpoint. Thank you to the Chief Minister, Fabian Picardo, for uh, talking to us about uh, the agreement in principle reached on New Year's Eve. And um, thank you for watching. Stay safe and good night.